technology or not, every organization has a business model. Yeah. Some are conscious, some are not. Some try to change us, some don't. Yeah. And some just compete on products, whereas they could compete on superior business models. So that idea of, hey, can we help companies rethink their business models? Be come aware up with new of stuff? it, and then... It was just something I was interested in. Ignition sequence five, three, two, one. Alex Osterwalder. How's it going, man? I'm Good so excited to, to have you on here. It's this a is, pleasure. This is fun because it's the first time we get to meet in person. Yeah. Uh, we're definitely Instagram friends, and uh, I had the privilege of working with you and Alan at Strategizer. Um, you're, I'm assuming uh, everybody knows you as the guy that created the business model canvas. Which, that was the uh, start. Yeah, dude, yeah. crazy. It's been, is it nine years now the book? Came out so the book came out 2009. So it's actually ten it's years. ten years. We wow. self-published first, okay, because we wanted to do something differently. So we created an innovative business model, and then we sold it to Wiley a, a year later. Okay. So most people think it's nine years because yeah. that's when Wiley published. Ten it. years, yeah. and then I first heard of it, Steve Blank. Was that yeah. now? I don't know outside of of Steve and mm. Lean Startup. Was it was it known in the the kind of the business? community prior and Steve brought a different audience to it or, no, or maybe it, it, he had no impact whatsoever yeah, but just so, from my perception we so I think he had an impact later on for sure I mean yeah. we, we were, were really good friends now but it started out we, we focused on the startup community so I did a PhD on the topic of business models with yeah. my co-author Yves Pignor and we were targeting startups so that's how it all started yeah but then later on, it was really large companies. So I'd say in the startup community, Steve really boosted it, brought it to another level. Mm -hmm. In the corporate um, space, we you know we just we are we were always international, so the book just spread across the it's world. And we give we have a freemium model where we always gave part of the book away. So part that's how of it all book. started. How does that work? Seventy pages. Okay. Yeah, our publisher freaked out. They, at the they Wiley gave yeah. you that even after the fact. Well, you know when we did the book. We had four colors, landscape format. We gave 70 pages away. Yeah. Because we were self-publishing, we could do what we wanted. Yeah. So later on, I asked Wiley, well, would you have let us do this You know, if, if we had started publishing with you? And our publisher said, no. not a chance. You, you did everything wrong. Yeah, he did the opposite. <laughs> we but did the opposite of what you were supposed to, to do. You know, the DNA of what you're teaching, right? Like, look yeah. at it. And yeah. So th it started out that way. We thought we can't write a book on business model innovation and not do it. So practice what you preach. So we really, we self-published. We got people to pay us to participate in the book. So we have 470 people who paid us to be okay. part of the book project. This is like early Kickstarter. -esque. This was before Kickstarter. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, like, this yeah, is really. Yeah. And then we asked them to, you know, later on, the first ones joined. We thought, ah, it's probably too cheap. So we doubled the price. We doubled okay. the price every couple of weeks. Until we got to two hundred and fifty dollars, wow, that's <laughs> real people money. would get their name into the book, so that was fun. We just, that's real we just money, I guess, around. to have your name yeah, in the yeah, book. Yeah. Where did the love for business models come from? So um, I was a, a student at the University of Lausanne doing uh, um, computer science, information systems, and Yves Pignier was one of my professors, mm -hmm. and he was looking for a PhD student, and he said, I'm, "I need somebody who's going to work on business models." And I was interested in a topic that would look at business from a different angle, would help me understand not marketing, operations, or finance, but kind of across the board, like what's the essence of a business? Because I studied political science, you question institutions. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, what is a business really? Oh, this topic of business models would allow me to go a bit deeper. So that's how it started out, and that's how you know we, we thought about different business models. How could we change things? And we were lucky with the timing. It was kind of the internet boom was just you know starting out. But with Eve, we always believed the topic of business models is for any company, you know, technology or not. Every organization has a business model. Yeah. Some are conscious, some are not. Some try to change us, some don't. Yeah. And some just compete on products, whereas they could compete on superior business models. So that idea of hey, can we help companies rethink? Their business models be come aware up with new of it, stuff. and then it was just something I was interested in. Yeah. And and did Eve have the foundation of what became the core components? No. So his starting point was, what if we could do you know like architect something like computer aided design for for entrepreneurs? That was the starting point. Okay. And he was looking for a PhD student to come up with the model, <laughs> and it was called the business model ontology. You know, this complicated word, so you can get a PhD. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, yeah. Make the word complicated, yeah, yeah, sounds, you'll get yeah, a PhD. Sounds fancy, yeah. But the idea was, could we come up with a rigorous model so we could build computer systems on top? 
So that was complicated stuff, went really in details in modeling. And then later on, after you know I left academia, went into practice, we took kind of the top layer, and that became the business model canvas. But what was below was you know rigorous academic was research. Was it like instruction? Like what was it like? Just a way to, to essentially quantify each aspect? It was just, you know, ontology means you're going to come up with a very rigorous description of a domain. You create the language for okay, that like domain. And there was or, yeah. nobody who really defined business models. We were not the first to talk about it. Yeah. But nobody had a really rigorous approach. So we just looked at all the work there. And like, you know, some people would make ontologies for birds. Yeah. <laughs> we made an, an ontology for business models. So that was kind of the starting point. was that point. your thesis, your PhD thesis? Yeah, it was called the business model oh, ontology. ontology. Yeah. Wow. The funny yeah. thing is people started downloading that, and that was like a, you know early indicators. Hey, there's something there. People want to know more. So. And what's the timeline between that and the book being self-published? So I started my academic work in 2000. So I had two job interviews in my life. One was with McKinsey. And like I got steamrolled. I was not ready for that. They, yeah. they, they just destroyed me. Yeah. The other one was with Eve. So I was super lucky <laughs> to get killed by McKinsey. <laughs> yeah. And now we Maybe work, you know, we help them, or yeah. we compete against them as strategizers. Yeah. And then um, I finished my PhD 2004. Mm -hmm. Then I went out in the world, helped a not-for-profit kind of scale, then became an entrepreneur more in the you know, in consulting space. Mm -hmm. And then at one point, um, I always got requests on business models because I had a blog. And I thought, hey, it's time to write a book. So I went back to Eve. That was 2008. And I asked them, hey, let's write this book that we always wanted to write. And we hired a designer at that time. You know, we needed somebody to help us with the visuals. That was Alan Smith, who's so now my cool. co-founder. So Canadian. that's how it started out. Love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Strategizer started at the same time then, or was that a, a spin-out of? No, that started later. So after the book was published and it started to be a success, I had to ask myself, well, what, are you, what am I going to do with my life? And, you know, you, the traditional path is you do consulting or you do training. Yeah. Or, you know, if you're not in academia. I already left academia a while ago. And I didn't want to do consulting. I already did that. And I just didn't think it was the fun thing to do normal, you know, selling your hours. Yeah. So I talked to Alan and said, hey, what if we started a software company? You know, having no idea, never done it. <laughs> just you know, to total ignorance. Like any entrepreneur who starts out is always ignorant. Yeah. <laughs> and we started that with an iPad app. So we said, let's, you know, we want to go into B2B, but let's start with an iPad app. Yeah. So we created an iPad app and that, you know, sold a couple hundred thousand copies so for $30. Cool. That was the starting point. Yeah. yeah. And what, I mean, right now, what does the work you do look like? Because I know you do a lot of workshops. You know, I follow you on Instagram. Yeah. Everybody should. Behind, you're really good at documenting the behind the scenes of, you know, kind of the creative process. What does your your work look like day to day? It's a mix. So, you know, Strategizer, the company is still at the core and building a platform is still the core thing we want to do. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we realized, and it was interesting experience in entrepreneurship, there was no real market for that type of software, you know, B2B, creating strategy software. Mm -hmm. So that is still in the coming and we're, we're getting a pretty good idea and moving towards the right direction. But it turned out that the thing that companies bought most at the beginning while we're building this market is actually online training. So scalable, interactive online training where on the one hand you have videos, but on the other hand you have coaches who can accompany you know, people in corporations. So we work with companies like MasterCard, Nestle and so on, and we help them scale these tools. So that brings me to one of the parts I'm most passionate about is building tools for business people. And I deliberately say business people because there are a lot of tasks that are similar from you know, the entrepreneur and startup, even solo entrepreneurs, they have a business model, mm -hmm. all the way to companies the size of GE or Nestle. You know, every company has a business model. Now what changes, of course, are the constraints. If you're a solo entrepreneur, a VC-backed entrepreneur, or if you're a corporation trying to invent new stuff, the context is different. So I'm passionate about building those tools yeah. and helping people do a better job, you know, in, in terms of inventing new stuff, yeah. in terms of managing their business. I think we can get a lot better at that. And what's an example of a tool? So the business model canvas was our first tool. Yeah. And I believe, you know, that, that innovators or managers can be a little bit more like surgeons. <laughs> so we always think, oh, we're going to make a business tool. It should do everything. No, it shouldn't. It should do one job. Really the business well. model canvas does one thing. It allows you to sketch out a business model. 
a new one or an existing one, and then you can do other things with it, right? But a surgeon who will never operate with a Swiss army knife, you know, a tool that does everything, should be the same in business. We should yeah. be like innovation surgeons or management surgeons where we use different kinds of business tools like the business model canvas, the value proposition canvas, the culture map or strategy maps. There's quite a few tools out there. I don't think all of them are really as rigorous as I'd like them to be or as simple to use as they should be to get to better adoption. Yeah. So there's a lot there, I think, that we can still do as a community of thinkers, making better business tools to help people do a better job. How often do you create a tool framework and then revisit it? Like, like yeah. how does that, because I mean, it's, it's, you know, I like to take a lot of my thinking and draw a model, but mm -hmm. then it's like, it's going to evolve. Yeah. Like, how do you, what's your process for creation? Yeah, good question. It's it's something we're thinking about a lot at the moment, together with Eve. We're going to train some of the top business thinkers at the Thinkers 50 event to yeah. create better tools, because they have great concepts. You're going to teach them how to create the tools. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. So they have great concepts. They do amazing research, but maybe their tools could be a little bit better. So we're, yeah. trying, we're trying to teach them. Let's see how they react. But so... If you take the business small canvas, that was the result of a PhD. So very long, four years, you know, going deep, and then but just taking the top layer. If we take our second tool, the value proposition canvas, that was a bit different. You know, it was no academic research behind it, but we do read all of the literature in that space. Anybody write something on value propositions? Is there anything good there already? Is anything being adopted? So we try to cover the basis. You know, what's what's the knowledge there? Yeah, what's the state of the art right now? And then based on that. We try to come up with some kind of first concepts, and like we immediately unique, test it. A unique aspect to it? or So um, we call it you know, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. Yeah, so trying that. to cover the problem space. Yeah. And we don't try to do everything. So when we say value proposition, that's all we try to do. We're not going to look at competitors. We're not going to look at the process. Like, okay, how do you come up with new, new value propositions? No, just how do I map? a value proposition. That's the only goal. And then everything we do is targeted at that and then make it as simple as possible so people will actually use it. And then we test a lot and we in change the workshops? it. Yeah, definitely. That's so a cool it, way it of doing talks. it. And, and then it might you know, kind of change over a couple of weeks or so. And then at one point, we're pretty sure that's the mature version. So with the value proposition, can we even change the, the shape of the thing because we realized people were saying, oh, that's just an evolution of the business model canvas. No, it's not. It's a plug-in. <laughs> As a business, you need great business models and you need a great value proposition. They're not the same thing. They're two different, I'd like to call it, jobs to be done of a business person. Mm. And then you need great implementation. Again, that's a different job to be done well, you're, where you'll use different tools. Mm -hmm. So we really think in terms of what are the most difficult jobs that business people are trying to get done? And where don't they already have tools? If there's something there that's great, yeah. we're not going to reinvent it. Yeah. We're going to use it. But if we think it's either not good enough or the adoption hasn't been good enough and we can do something you know, to change it, we'll create something new. So our last tool is the business portfolio map. That's really at the decision maker level. Mm -hmm. Not business models, but how do I allocate resources in great products and business models in order to reinvent my business you know, substantial all the time, um, systematically. And when you, I mean, you work with such incredible companies. How do you communicate to them? Because I mean, it's easy for you seeing the forest from the trees. They're in it. You know, it's you know sometimes as consultants, it's you know oh change this and la di da di, and yeah. they're thinking of all this other complexity around bonus structures and you know job yeah. stuff. Um, how do you communicate or influence change? Like, what's your yeah. tool for doing that? Because yeah. I feel like every yeah. leader has to. Yeah. And then, you know, there's so many, as you said, so many consultants out there. There's so much information. You know, what are we doing differently? And, and I think one of the things that we always try to do with Strategizer, with Eve, is to simplify things. It's just what's the essence of what you want, what you need to know. And I think when it comes to innovation, which is the core topic that we work on most, mm -hmm. you know, we help large companies with that. There are a lot of myths. One is innovation is expensive and it's risky. Well, no, it's not. It's only <laughs> expensive and risky when you make big bets. But in innovation, we now know we make small bets 
many small bets and we only invest in those projects that, that show promise. some evidence right? that promise. So it's like venture capital investment. Yeah. So we try to show, there are two things I actually try to show senior leaders. The first one is, in a business, you have two main goals, managing the existing and inventing the future. For a very long time, it was, it was sufficient to be world-class at execution, managing what you have. Is that the portfolio stuff that yeah, you talked about? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. the existing portfolio, right? Yeah. And, and companies do that relatively well, yeah. but it's not enough anymore. No. More and more companies are getting disrupted. Speed of change. Yeah, and the classic example is Kodak. <laughs> they yeah. got disrupted. And it's not that they didn't do innovation. They actually invented the digital camera. But that's innovation suicide because mm. they killed analog film, right? So they almost you know, innovated themselves to death. What they didn't do well enough is come up with new business models that would prepare them for the future. They did a little bit, but they didn't take it seriously enough because all of their assets were invested in factories, right? Mm. But there's a counterexample. That's why I like still using Kodak, this <laughs> example that everybody uses, Fujifilm turned into a technology company because early enough they realized, hey, that business is, is being disrupted right now. They saw we, it dying. They saw it coming. They were in the number two. Maybe that's yeah. why they saw it coming. They yeah. weren't arrogant. So they created a portfolio of new things. You know what the obvious thing is? Do you know what they invested? One of the first things they invested no. in? Cosmetics. If you're in film, you go into cosmetics. You know why? I don't see the connection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's not obvious <laughs> to me. I'm sorry. It's like <clears throat> keeping film alive is like aging skin. So it turns out the chemicals and the patents and the knowledge you have in you know, keeping film alive, analog film, is very similar to keeping your skin nice. Wow. So they could take the knowledge they had there, and Scientists, it was one of the first things research. they did. right? So based on the technology they had, on the patents they had, the knowledge and the production capabilities, they said, what else could we do? So you know, innovation doesn't always start with the customer. In that case, it started with knowledge and patents. Inventory of their assets. Yeah, but they were rigorous enough to explore, to explore new business models. So that's a great case of a company that did that well. And I think today, there's still not enough companies that do that well. So I like to first position it as, if you want to stay alive another 10 years, another decade, yeah. you need to not just manage the existing, mergers and acquisitions, not going to do it, Cost, cost cutting is not going to do it. You're going to more efficiently die because yeah. <laughs> you're going to get disrupted. You need to create a portfolio of new opportunities okay. of which only few, only few will succeed. Even that concept, I'm sure, for, for managers out there of, of, of saying, I'm, I'm probably going to be wrong, is yep. a foreign concept for it them. It doesn't exist, yeah. Yeah. And so you come in and tell them that. And then what's your prescription to help them innovate? Like in regards to saying, well, you don't have yeah. to make big bets. Yeah. W is there guidelines for yeah. how to properly yeah. allocate resources and, yeah. and create a feedback cycle? Yeah. For the first one is to, to really admit that you don't know, to be very humble. Okay. So you know what the ratio is to create one outlier, one big success? If you're an established company, you know how many projects you would have to invest in to create one outlier? Turns out it's 250 projects to get one outlier. Now, where do I take wow. those numbers from? Yeah. <laughs> from early stage venture capital. So 60% of all early stage investments, they don't return capital. So you lose money, yeah. right? And they're only, there's only you know, um, one small. out of, four out of a thousand, one out of 250 that returns 50 times capital. Yeah. So if you want to get to that outlier, guess what you have to do? You have to invest failures. in many. You will have a lot of failures. And I talked to the CEO of uh, Logitech just a couple of weeks ago, Bracken Darrell, amazing person. He said, Alex, don't, don't call it killing projects. It's negative. Call it shelving projects. Mm -hmm. It's like you read a book, you learned something, you're going to put it away, and maybe you'll actually take it out there again. Yeah. You read a lot of books to get to one really good one, right? and it's the same in innovation. You might invest in 250, and then for but six to eight influence. weeks— yeah, they influence yeah, what you're going to get out there. So after 6 to, to 12 weeks, let's say, you know, do this kind of innovation that's discovery That's the timeline, sprint. yeah. That's the first timeline. You only do follow-up investments in those that show evidence. So you might weed out, you might shelve 50% of the projects. So see how the small bets? Yeah. Already after, you know, uh, 12 weeks, you kind of know now, okay, okay I'm going to weed out 50%. Because maybe the ideas were wrong. The teams are not necessarily stupid. They just worked on something. It's not the moment. But you'll also weed out the teams that are not so entrepreneurial. They're better maybe at execution. That's what I was going to ask. Because it yeah. sounds like this is true entrepreneurship. Yes. Um, yes. 
and I'm assuming some a leader could misallocate a resource, a team member to Completely. that team. Yeah. And you're saying that that's actually one of the things that's you're looking point. at. It's yeah. like, oh, they yeah. they because don't really you have that. Pick, you don't know, so you can't you can't pick the winners. It's impossible. Not even venture capitalists yeah. can pick the winner. The so a manager's yeah. not going to be able to do it either, right? Yeah. I mean, how could you? Super so, arrogant. So so it's the yeah, it's very arrogant. So it's this funnel, this funnel that you create. And the best ones will will kind of bubble up. What do you see that kind of dollar investment to create that for large companies looking like? So in terms of stages, so it always depends. The more you want to get out of it. So if you want a billion dollar return, yeah. you're going to have to invest in many projects. That but 250 in this, ish. Yeah, something like that. But you know, we work with uh, Bayer and, and Bosch, and they have about 60 to 80 teams every year. Mm -hmm. You already get some really good results. You won't yeah. get a billion dollar business out of that, but no, you will get million. some good returns, yeah. right? So in the beginning stage, you know, for the first eight to 12 weeks, something like $10,000 is enough, or maybe even $5,000 per team. That's peanuts, right? Yeah. That's nothing. And then at the next stage, you will increase their time that they work on the project, and you'll also give them a little bit more money so they can do different types of experiments. Interviews doesn't cost anything, right? You can do that just with your time. But then afterwards, you might start making some first, you know, kind of proofs of concept, whatever Prototypes, industry you're in. Yeah. So there you might allocate $50,000, but you already have less teams. So the budget might actually stay the same per phase. Yeah. And then afterwards, after maybe four months, you narrow it down again. So you, you take away 50% of the teams and you might give them $500,000. So it's the same process as in venture-backed, you know, um, startups. It's very similar it's just that we don't really do this in corporations as much as we should today. We invest in startups, which is also good, yeah. but it shouldn't be either or. It's both. And it's what's really the, the, I mean, if you call them pods or teams, what is the makeup of a good project innovator team yeah, look like? It's, it should be a mix. So it, it really depends on the industry, right? Yeah. So if you're in pharma, <laughs> you probably want a lawyer <laughs> as part of the team or at least the lawyer part of the cohort. Yeah. Um, if you're in software, it always will be, you know, at the Developer. beginning, just a, a, a designer and a coder, right? And the teams at the beginning should be very small. I'd say one to three people max. Max. Because you'll overinvest. Mm -hmm. And the problem is the more resources you put into a project at the early stage. The more you're going to want it to work. The less you can actually kill it. It's even yeah. worse than that. That's it. Because then teams are going to say, we invested so Some much time cost. and energy, we can't turn around. And then all of a sudden, this project is really big. Nobody dares to kill it anymore. So these things grow, whereas they should be should be uh, shelved. Let's yeah. call it that way. So really having a rigorous process where after a couple of weeks, a couple of months, you always check who's showing most evidence. It's the evidence that should allow a team to move from one stage to another, not the idea. Ideas are easy. It's the evidence. When, when you sit down with big companies or any company, I'm assuming like because you're so passionate about the business model concept, do you like map it out in your head? Like if you if you start if you're sitting next to a guy on a plane and he's like, Yeah, I run this hundred million a year company, yeah. what are kind of the questions you're asking him to kind of yeah. reverse engineer? <laughs> yeah. And so I don't I, know if you do you yeah. do that? Because I Oh uh, for sure. Yeah. So immediately, you know, in my head, in my glasses, maybe you can't yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah, there's yeah, the business model canvas, canvas in there. Yeah. yeah. And you're just like So I really think it through because I, I do believe today. There's still, you know, there's room for improvement for what questions people ask, leaders ask. Mm -hmm. They're very focused on product and segment, maybe pricing, and that's okay. But that's just the foundation. I start to really ask about the business model. So, you know, a typical question I would ask is, okay, is the is the customer locked in? Are there switching costs? If it's easy for a customer to switch, well, guess what? The business model is not that good. So I remember, you know, take GoPro as an example. GoPro was hyped by Super stock market hype. analysts. And yeah, they had a great product. My kids love it. I think it's pretty cool. But their business model was a disaster. Like there was no lock-in. There was no proprietary technology. So it was all branding. And branding can't always keep you ahead for very long. It's, very, it's getting very competitive out there. So they tried to change the business model, become more of a media company, but they had no lock-in. So that's the one fundamental it's question first thing I you're asking ask. is just yeah. like can things the like customer that. Easily switch. Yeah, those kind of uh, questions get you to understand. Or, you know, are you earning um, transactional revenues or recurring revenues? Okay. So when you're in SaaS, it's easy, right? Yeah. It's, it's recurring, recurring revenues. Yeah. But in many industries, people don't question the difference between transactional revenues, which are hard, cost yeah. of sales, yeah. again and again Success and again. Success fees or yeah. Yeah, performance based. Recurring revenues. Sometimes you can bring them into an industry that didn't have that. 
Yeah. So that's what Nespresso did to coffee. Crazy. And that's an old example, but it's still, you know, amazing how they changed the business model of an industry. They yeah. created recurring revenues and lock-in where it didn't exist. Yeah. So the question, you know, I always try to ask is how could you change the business model in your industry? Mm -hmm. And most companies don't because they don't even question the business model. They yeah. focus so much on product and, and uh, target customer segments that they forget, well, maybe you could change the business model. Great example is Hilti, the tool maker. What they did is they moved from selling products transactionally to a service model. And they became a logistics company managing a fleet of tools for their customers. That was and, a problem that needed to get done. Yeah, but yeah. nobody looked at it that way because, you know, while it seems easy to say it like this, it's a big change from a production Did they pivot company. from their core business they to pivoted, that? They pivoted, yeah. That's they tough. pivoted, yeah. But I think, so that's what's interesting. I'm seeing more and more companies not just coming up with new business models, but also pivoting the old ones. Yeah. We call that business model shifts. Shifts. Yeah. And, I mean, people ask and debate how many different types of businesses there are. And, I mean... Yeah. It's tough because a business model canvas, you've got those components. So if you change it, it's a factor of whatever. It's unlimited. Unlimited. And that's what I would think. I, you know, there's no right or wrong business model. There's a better business model for a certain moment. Yeah. And you don't know which one is going to work. So all yeah. you can do is experiment. So what we're working on with our new book called The Invincible Company. Very arrogant, right? Yeah. <laughs> the Invincible yeah, yeah, yeah. Company. I saw that, yeah. But is a pattern library where you can go and look, okay, this and this business model, could I use it? Like in software, a pattern. pattern library, yeah, just like design patterns. Bring it in, exactly, design patterns in architecture. Bring it in, then still, you know, you can create a better business model design. You still need to test it. Yeah, but, but it'll I get think, you there faster. Yeah, and I think companies are so focused on just aspects of the business model that they forget, well, let's work on the business model itself. Yeah. That's a design aspect, a business design aspect. Yeah. And in particular, the more you're in an engineering-driven culture, the less people really think through the business model. You can really ask some fundamental questions. Could we do this or could we do that? But you need to unlearn. You actually need to forget which business model you're in today and ask what could be. You know, mm. like, an, like an architect or industrial designer, yeah. they ask what could be, and they yeah. imagine possibilities. And then try to figure out if yeah. the physics. If they could work. If yeah. it could work. <laughs> exactly. If um, they could make it work. If you had to design a business, Alex, yeah. what, what, is the, what is your favorite business? Like, you know what I mean? Like from a model point of view, like people like reoccurring because yeah. it's predictable. I get it. But like yeah. from your point of view, what so model? I have a favorite pattern, which is getting others to do the work. Okay. Of okay. course. Right? How did that work? <laughs> yeah, how did that work? I mean, think of it. Facebook gets 2 billion people to work for them for free. The value of Facebook comes from the content that 2 billion people create. I mean, that's wow. my favorite thing. Yeah. Then I mentioned that, you know, to, to Fortune 50 companies and say, yeah, that's, but that's digital. That's, yeah. you know, that's they Facebook. They can do that. We can't do yeah. that. But then think IKEA. Like, people used to buy furniture. <laughs> I definitely work for Ikea when there I buy you go. Ikea. There you go. So now, you know, what they did is they outsourced part of their value chain, right? Their supply so chain. So true. So you can do it anywhere. Or think credit card company. Who does the work for the credit card the banks, companies? Banks, the issuing banks. The issuing banks, yeah. but also the, the merchants and the people, you know, who buy, yeah. who go to the restaurants. So there are a lot of other demand, yeah. stakeholders who actually do the work for you. So you want to ask yourself, how can you get others to create value in your business model? It's a very interesting question, right? And the more you get others to create value in your business model, the higher the value. Or think, you know, Apple, when they launched the App Store, who does the work in the App Store? All the developers. There you go. So there's so many ways of getting others to create value for your business model. And it's not just for digital companies like Facebook. You really yeah. can ask that question. So that's one pattern that I really like because yeah. it's fun. You yeah. know? And you increase the barriers of, of entry as well yeah. at the same time. Because you have an army of people yeah. innovating for and you. And that's hard to copy. So yeah. take the iPhone. The technology is easier to copy. All the phones kind of look the same these yeah. days. What you can't copy overnight is the App Store or Google Play. Those two bastions are impossible to copy Penetrate, overnight. Yeah. It's, it's, it's practically impossible. And that's why you have two operating systems today, and that's why Windows died. They could never build up that army of developers. That's why you have two platforms. I love I love that question. Is there other questions? Like one question I like to ask is, you know, if somebody bought you tomorrow, what's the first thing they would change? If they bought 
Your our company, company, any company, it's just like a really good way to get rid of your biases. And you know, Andy yeah. Grove came up with that question yeah. from Intel. Yeah. yeah. Is there any other questions that you like to ask to help leaders? Yeah. Get uh, clear about strategy yeah. or priorities and stuff like that. The biggest one is what's the evidence. <laughs> so, I think um, leaders today they rely a lot on opinion or past experience. But the fundamental thing you want to ask these days is what needs to be true for this idea to work? Mm. I find that an incredibly powerful question. I think the framing of it came from Roger Martin, number one business thinker in the world. And it's really powerful because that will always give you the underlying assumptions. Or you could call them hypothesis, to use yeah. a fancy word. What needs to be true for this idea to work? And then based on that, you'll, okay, you'll figure out some assumptions. Which is, and in some ways, them. first principles to the idea. Yeah. But people don't question their assumptions. They just believe them. You just right? gave me like this flashback. I had these kids that were building a, um, they're building a gym, like a park, like a play park. And uh, the idea was their their business idea. They got they got they won the the award to build an energy generating play park. What needs to be true? Well, that the amount of energy being produced is actually materialistic enough to you know what i mean and yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. or the cost yeah. to produce the equipment yeah. to yeah. Create, like it was like these first principles i'm like you did not talk to anybody that knows any good it's just it's such a good question of just like okay it's like uber it's like for this to work what needs to be true yeah. okay let's yeah. go see if we can validate yeah. those yeah. assumptions yeah um and then like do you ever see yourself getting bored around just digging and scratching around the business model stuff so we we're Cause you've been way at it be, yeah but we're way beyond the business model stuff. So yeah. we still don't see enough adoption of business model thinking. So we yeah. still push that. So yeah. when I don't see people you know doing something that I, I believe you know could be important, you need to ask yourself: Are you hallucinating, or is it something that you're doing wrong and how you're getting it into the market? So there's some of that still. But we didn't get stuck with the business model stuff. So we, you know, if, and I say we, we strategize and Eve and yeah. so on. We always ask ourselves, why do established companies, our target market, why, do, why don't they innovate yet? Yeah. And as long as they don't innovate, then well, we didn't no have the right answer. So it's easy to say, well, they're stupid. No, they're not. We're not doing our job. So we so need to help them. So you yeah. had to figure out the question to ask yourself. Yeah. It's almost like one level up first. So we go one thing after the other. So at the beginning, it was the business model. Then okay. it was the value now proposition. Now we have a language to talk about this. Yeah, exactly. Why are they not innovating? Exactly. And so we came the to the culture. To well, then we came to culture. So together yeah. with a guy called Dave Gray, we created mm -hmm. the culture map. So, yeah. okay, we started that. But then the, the big thing for me was, you know, the more I was able to talk to leaders, the more I realized there, there's still a lot of myths out there about innovation. They're just not true. So with Eve, we sat down and we asked, what language can we create for leaders? So with the business model canvas, we created something for doers. Yeah. But at the top level of Nestle or GE or whatever, you don't think business models. You think allocation of resources to different business units or business models. Mm -hmm. So what's the language we could create at that level? What's the tool we could create? So we came up with the portfolio map. So that's how we kind of just... You know, go from one Chisel problem to the other. One problem to the next. As long as we haven't solved it, I'm not going to get bored. Yeah. The moment we solve it, maybe, Which, you know, but we'll find something else. It, it, yeah, <laughs> it'll uncover the next step. Yeah, yeah. So the new book is around that. And yeah. what are some of the high level concepts in the book that yeah. you feel the market yeah. have resonated with? So the, the big one is the business portfolio map. So it's this whole idea that in an established company, and that could be a 30 person company, mm -hmm. you need to manage the existing and you need to invent the new. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what, you know, for a long time we call this the ambidextrous organization. So the term has been around, a lot of books have been written about it, but nobody's really done it. So we try to create practical tools to get companies to become ambidextrous. Mm -hmm. And the portfolio map is one of those tools. So that's a big one that really got traction with leaders. Because every the world. leader has to do that. Yes. And also, you know, push the, like the innovation. Yeah. So like, you know, in the SaaS space, a Slack, a Dropbox, what, what would you see, if you're looking at Dropbox, what's this, and I, you know, what is the thing that they need to manage versus where did like, how do you see them doing that? What's the right way to think about it? I think the the right way to think about it is just to create this space where people, and when I say space, I don't mean the physical space, but the cultural space and the- To um, talk about you know, it. The metrics and so on, just to try out new stuff. And I don't know Dropbox from the inside well yeah. enough, but you take a company like Amazon or you take Ping An in, in China, you know, yeah. finance company that became yeah. a tech company, they demystify failure. 
And, you know, it's popular these days to say, yeah, you know, you need to let people fail. But how many companies actually do that? <laughs> how does how many, Amazon do that? Amazon, well, it's from the top down, the, the CEO says failure and success, innovation, invention, failure are inseparable twins. Yeah. And, you know, to investors, he says, he wrote this in an investor letter, 2016, for the 2015 annual report. He said, Amazon is the best place in the world to fail, period. Like, how many CEOs do you hear saying that? So it turns out, Ping An <laughs> in China has the same approach. So if at the very top, you really allow failure to happen for innovation, I'm not talking about build a new warehouse, you're not yeah. going to fail at Amazon, no. you're not going to last for very long. Yeah. But they really experiment. They ask, why not? And they have tons of failure. And Amazon fire. Yeah, you bet. And they're <laughs> proud of it. Yeah. So teams don't get fired for failing. Celebrate. If it's an experiment, right? They celebrate because they know that they need to fail a lot to create that one outlier. Remember the numbers? Yeah. 250 to 1. You're not going to get that outlier. No, so if you want to produce a billion-dollar business, it's not going to come from 10 projects. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. And, and companies who do innovation well, and Amazon is still at the very top there. I'd add some like Ping An. In China, there and maybe Tencent, Alibaba, they really have this culture of experimentation. Mm -hmm. Why not? But not just in their core business, beyond. Right? Imagine a book retailer launches Amazon Web Services. Makes Who would have sense. ever thought <laughs> that you know the biggest competitor in cloud comes from a retailer? Because they said, why not? They had to you know, sell this service internally from the networking team to the software team. And they said, well, why shouldn't we do this for internet companies? And then all of a sudden it was banks, pharmaceutical companies. It's a why not culture. And we don't have that enough in established companies. Again, from small to big, the more success you have, the more risk averse you get. Yeah. It's a paradox. And then you should actually reinvent yourself while you're successful. So did a lot of that come from the culture work you did and then yeah use the we, portfolio we were map. just seeing this in companies and then we tried to find little answers you know to go next step next step next step uh -huh. i think the big one that that we just kind of finalized now is innovation metrics okay how do you measure the reduction of risk and uncertainty because mm. that's what managers fear so if we can measure it we can take away some of that fear so that's one thing another What's one of the these concepts well, you measure risk and uncertainty so you say this project this level based on the evidence you know, it's 100% uncertainty. We have no evidence. <laughs> it's just an opinion. Looks okay. great on paper, but there's no evidence. The slide deck looks great. The you know spreadsheet. So the looks metrics great. is probability. Like, what's the what do you measure? The me you actually measure for each. So they're they're basically about four. We we narrow it down to four risk areas: desirability. Do people want it? Yeah. Feasibility. Can we actually build, build it? Can we get the IP and so on? And then viability, can we make more money from it than we spend? Then we add a fourth one. So these three are pretty popular. And we add a fourth one called adaptability. Is it the right timing? And, you know, can our technology, et cetera, survive for the next five, ten years? Yeah. Those are four risk categories. Yeah. So you need to show me for all of those four risk categories the evidence that you're on the right track. Did you do some pricing experiments? Okay, uh, we talked to 10 customers. Oh, that's pretty weak evidence. Show me stronger evidence. So it's, it's qualitative at that point. At that point, it's qualitative, but then you do stronger experiments. Yeah. So it's only with the stronger experiments that you, you reduce risk more. Yeah. If you have pre-sales, great. Boom. Then If you have simulated sales, even better, because that's the real thing. Yeah. So that's how you will prove that you could actually scale this. And you can do simulated sales before you build anything. It's so another one of these myths. You need to build something to test. You don't. Kickstarter is proof of that. And even before a Kickstarter, right? You yeah. just, you know, you put a data sheet in front of your B2B customers and you can have a great conversation. You could even put a brochure in front of B2B customers, almost get to the sales <laughs> conversation, yeah. get very, very strong feedback. Do they have the budget? Will they be willing to pay? So I think we're not sophisticated enough in how we test. Mm. So we wrote a book together with um, David Bland called Testing Business Ideas. Mm -hmm. It's a library of 44 experiments. It's going to come up in November. Super cool. So that is really to help people get more sophisticated in how they test and how they reduce risk and uncertainty. And you can measure that based on the evidence. Alex, you have uh, made the transition, which I think a lot of people in academia hope to, to entrepreneurship and, and, you know, building this really incredible consulting and or product company. Um, how did you do that? Like, who are the people that you look to 
maybe in their career mm. or that inspired you like what what model of you know what i mean like how did that just or so, was it just every year you just kept plugging away at it? but i mean it's really following, remarkable following my passion you know you know something about yeah. that right just doing what i enjoy most and then things fall you know into place and then getting very lucky with the people i meet going in the right direction meeting you know eve steve blank um, alan is really just following my passion um, so I'd say the biggest inspirations were probably Prince, <laughs> the musician, because he never really cared what people think. I don't care mm. what people think. I'm going to follow my passion and try to do great work. That's as basic as it, as it gets. Just do great work. And then based on that, you know, just follow my path. And in academia, I found there was too much rigor. So you publish to publish in, in journals that nobody reads. Yeah. And I couldn't get passionate about that. So I went out and, you know, actually, one of the reasons also that I left academia is I tried. Nobody wanted to hire me. Now they bring me back for <laughs> a lot a of money cycle. to give a talk. So Isn't that funny? <laughs> go to Stanford and Berkeley yeah. and so on. So it's just kind of funny. You know, I tried out stuff. Some of it worked. Some of it didn't. But most important for me, the fact was always, what am I passionate about? What do I really want to do? What do I want to spend time with? Yeah. And then, you know, if you don't like it, just move on. How, it. how do you juggle uh, the entrepreneurial stuff with the family stuff? That's a very good question. So it's up and down. And probably now three or four years ago, for me, it was a big eye-opener. I was spending way too much time at work, Mm -hmm. and I had to recalibrate. And I actually had to recalibrate my definition of success. Mm -hmm. Success is not just, you know, fame and wallet. (laughs) Success is, well, individual. You have to ask yourself, what do you want to achieve in life? What's important to you? And I had to just recalibrate and say, well, important for, for me it's my family. It's my kids. My wife is number one. Yeah. And, and two is really that was core. And then give business a bit, you know, less space. I mean, today we've seen a talk here at Business of Software where somebody said, oh, you can only get three out of five. No, you can't. That's Not a true. question of choice, right? But then it's hard to actually Discipline. say, well, you're disciplined. Do, you know, is it, do I have to go from zero to 50 million in revenues in X years? What's the difference? Like, what is it going to make as a difference? In yeah. some industry, yes, because you might get killed. Yeah. But in some Literally industries, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just a, a burden you put on yourself. Yeah. And you'll pay the price. Are you happy with the price? Do it. If you're not, don't. And but for be, me, family be, is be important. Be aware. So you be essentially, aware. like, fast-forwarded it yeah. and said, hey, if I continue. Yeah. 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 And since I'm a bit obsessed by modeling, of course, I was <laughs> sat down, <laughs> made some really? circles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it took t- some my personal offset. Yeah. It took two days yeah. and just started putting up sticky notes, drawing and just asked, what do I really want from life? Do you, you think that around? type of content will ever show up in your profession? I think work? so. Yeah. So already now in the company. So I really believe that, you know, we want to create a workspace where everybody does, number one, does their best work and yeah. they only work on stuff they really want to work on. It's pretty hard, but I think you can do it. And then if somebody leaves because they don't have a problem to solve it, strategize it, excites them, that's fine. That's That's okay. But people should never leave for any other reason other than starting a new company or working on something else that they're passionate about. They won't find with us. So in that sense, it's already showing up today in the work. And then later on, so I don't just believe in innovation for financial growth. (laughs) That's one thing. But I believe in innovation for a better workplace. Mm-hmm. So what are the tools that will help us create a better workplace? And that's where the culture map is already a start. We use it for innovation at the moment. But at the end of the day, better you know. Better place to work. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of companies could have a huge impact on the world immediately. All the employers, if they fo- focused on that, the world would change overnight. overnight. Right? And we just say, oh, business is business. That's different. No, it's not. You're still a human being. Yeah. <laughs> So the role of business, I think, is changing. Great leaders like Paul Pullman at Unilever, yeah. they're changing their mindset. In that case, it's sustainability. You have uh, Patagonia, but you have a lot of companies, or here, HubSpot, they, yeah, they really put people at the center now. And mm-hmm. I think you know, less and less people are going to accept the crappy workspaces or workplaces that we have, and they're totally. just going to vote with their feet. So yeah, it's a great, um, great thing to do. One question I like to ask, Alex, as we wrap up, um, you know, obviously you've uh, had a lot of success as an entrepreneur, but who did you need to become to be the CEO you are today when you look back at the Alex? <laughs> well, um, I think just constantly questioning yourself. So I have a great coach, Shani Ospina. I had the opportunity to work with Marshall Goldsmith, number one leadership <laughs> coach in the world. Uh, yeah. 
is just always questioning, am I doing the right thing? Always trying to get to the next level in terms of how I work. <laughs> so I think I, you know, I got better at what I'm doing because I was never happy with, I always wanted a better version of myself, which is terrifying. And maybe sometimes you also need to say, hey, just relax, you know, you're a human being. And, yeah. But that, you know, I think gets everybody to improve. And then I was lucky enough to find some great coaches. So that was pure luck. But that helped me get to a different level, look at things differently. And I do think um, 10 years ago, you know, if I look at who I was 10 years ago, I'm embarrassed, right? <laughs> Two different people. Oh, my goodness, yeah. And that, that's what it should be, right? Alain yeah. de Botton, the philosopher, says, if you look back and you're not terrified by the person you, you were, <laughs> you probably didn't do, make enough progress. So that's I, really I like cool. that way of looking at things. Alex, where do people find you online? So just at strategizer, blog.strategizer.com. That's where we share a lot of our ideas for free. That's awesome. Thanks so much for coming Thanks on. Thanks for having you. This is great. You, that was awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.